Hello, my name is Apollo Clark. In this presentation, I'll be showing you how to do threat hunting in the cloud and how to deploy a multi-tier web application within AWS using a variety of HashiCorp products. We'll be going over the specific use case problem we're trying to solve, the overall high level approach to the problem, the solution of specific technologies that can be used to solve it, I'll be showing you the actual code to run this. First off, the problem. Fundamentally, how do we detect and prevent security incidences in the cloud? This is a very pressing issue for many large and medium-sized organizations, particularly ones which handle financial and medical data. As part of American security compliance regulations, such as PCI for payment data, HIPAA for medical data, as well as other forms of personally identifiable information. Um, companies, for example, within the insurance industry and finance industry have their own regulations, including such as uh, New York State Department of Financial Services, NYDFS, for insurance providers, what's known as MARS-E. And recently, Europe, the European Union has enacted the GDPR regulations. So it's no longer enough merely to deploy infrastructure. It needs to be done securely. For this project, I ended up creating this network diagram, going from the middle, left to right. First, we have our Amazon WAF, which is a web app firewall, very common way to prevent common and low level attacks. The WAF, in turn, will talk to our SSH bastion host. This allows developers to securely log into the bastion host first which is locked down to a given company's network. This will allow them to talk to the internal build services, including GitLab, Jenkins, and JMeter. GitLab is used to store source code. Jenkins is the build service. JMeter is a stress testing service to ensure that the infrastructure can handle the expected load. On the bottom, we have the ELK stack, which is from Elasticsearch Company. This allows us to collect logs and monitoring for the various services, including the ones that we deploy, as well as ones native to AWS. These logs are then backed up into an S3 bucket, which is a generic file storage. We include CloudWatch, which is the AWS native monitoring service. This then goes to SNS, the simple notification service. So for example, if we give an event such as a web server is having a hard time scaling, the SNS will trigger and cause the service to auto scale and create new instances. Now, the web app layer, which is in the center, starts off with the web app firewall talking to the ALB, which is a load balancer. This allows us to deploy multiple servers behind a single IP address. Makes management very easy. Within the auto scaling group, we have an HTTP cache layer. This is specifically varnish. What this allows us to do is to cache web requests. Oftentimes what happens with most applications for a given user is they will talk to the web server and then the web server will talk to a database. The response comes back, gets processed and returned. The problem with this direct solution is that many times the data coming from the SQL database doesn't actually change. So if I go to a website and hit it once a minute as an individual user, that data is probably not going to change very much. It may not change for once an hour, even once a day. And the amount of time and compute resources required to process that request tends to be rather expensive. The HTTP caching layer allows us to store those requests and no longer needing to scale up such large web services and SQL instances, allowing company to save a lot of money. The HTTP cache layer will then talk to the web service layer. This can include things such as Apache, Tomcat, Nginx, or any other web service that can be hosted internally. For this specific project, I only created a single web service layer, but this could be used to deploy a multiple web service layer. For example, there could be an authentication service layer. There could be a shopping cart layer, a metrics layer, for example. The web application layer will then talk to the session store, the SQL database, the file store, and the email relay. 
the session store allows us to store information on individual users who are logged in. It's a very simplistic form of database, but it is very fast and cheap to run. Next, we have our SQL database. In this case, I went with Amazon Aurora, which is a AWS managed MySQL variant. It makes it very easy to deploy, and we no longer have to worry about frequent upgrades and downtime windows. It's all handled by Amazon internally. Following that is our file store. This is where we can store generic static files, such as photos, documents, video, etc. This is access to this, can be done through the web layer. For internal users, it can be accessed using an AIM role, which I'll get into later. Finally, we have our email relay, in this case, the simple email service. This allows the web application to send out email notifications to the various users. So the approach, even if we have this infrastructure, the real question is how do we do this securely with multiple levels of logging and monitoring? On a high level, these are the seven things that I generally go for when deploying a service like this. Number one is inventory management. In other words, what are the collection of everything that we have been deploying? <clears throat> it's very difficult to defend a network or an infrastructure if you don't know what's there. Next is access management. In other words, who are the users within the system who may be coming from external IPEs or other businesses and companies? And who are the internal admins? Next is configuration management. Configuration management is now that we know what we deployed, how was it configured to be deployed? This can include things such as the Amazon resources, as well as what's running within the web application itself. Next is patch management, because as much as we enjoy using AWS resources, ultimately we still need to run our own servers and those need to be upgraded over time. Next is our logging and monitoring system. Fine. Number six is the alerting. So once we have our logs, it would be extremely tedious to have a person manually crawl through them. Therefore, we want to find common patterns that we know may be bad or questionable and generate alerts to know to allow the uh, SOC analysts to go in and do their investigations. Finally, we have automated remediation. In other words, if we've done everything, one through six, can we find situations and scenarios which we know are bad beyond any, any guesses? And is there any way for us to mitigate them? For example, if somebody were to put a S3 bucket with customer data onto the public internet without any authentication, that's a very bad thing. However, we do have the ability using automation tools to prevent that from happening and to, if we do see that being deployed, to turn it off. On a high level, the tools I'll be using for this are the AWS CLI. Just for demo purposes, this allows us to talk to the Amazon resources the triangular circular icon in the middle on the right hand side is Facebook's OS query. This allows us to look at the servers which we have deployed, monitor them for changes, and keep track of all of their configuration. At the bottom is the Elasticsearch ELK stack. This will be our logging and monitoring service. <clears throat> on a high level, when I was designing this, I wanted to keep it simple, which is a simple thing to say, but rather difficult to actually implement. What keeping it simple means to me is creating a service which I can hand off to a junior engineer who has one to three years of training and experience, and they are able to manage it. This means using modern technologies with high levels of abstraction, which have robust documentation and are easy for new people to learn and maintain. Next up is I want to reuse existing systems. I didn't want to go out and create a lot of custom code. I wanted to see how far I could get using open source solutions. Next is to write as little code and configuration as possible. It's 2019. While I could go and use an older technology such as Bash and do a lot of things manually, ultimately I'd rather use automation to the benefit and write as little as possible to get the most results. Next is to keep the entire service fully automated. I've automated this entire project to the point that a single command can take a AWS environment with nothing and fully deploy this entire solution. Next is for any of the security alerts, I want to make sure they have close to zero, zero is impossible, but very low false positives for the security findings. 
And finally, I wanted to use um, less expensive, more commodity services within AWS to keep the cost low. So this all sounds great, but how do we actually build something like this? <clears throat> so this right here is a rather technical example of how to use the AWS CLI to say, give me a list of all the servers within the account. Rather esoteric, but this is how we can do inventory management. Next is access management. This is using again the AWS CLI, which says, give me a list of all the users. This is something that a SOC team should look at once a day to see if new users are coming on board. Within a large organization, you may see two or three people coming on every single day. But when you start seeing 10, 20, or 100 coming in per day, it's something to look into. At the bottom is the OS query SQL query, which allows us to ask the servers which users have access. This allows us to keep track of who can access the AWS account, as well as who can access the servers. Next is configuration management. Uh, some specific examples of this would be the AWS cloud resources, specifically the firewall rules. What access do the AWS IAM users have to change things? What are our network security rules? And what are our file store S3 bucket rules for access? This is just examples of the AWS cloud resource configurations. On the servers, which we deploy, we can look at things such as who can log in over SSH, what are the servers actually running for processes, which network services are running and listening, and finally, how are they actually configured? All of these things can become a source of vulnerability, but by managing them and maintaining them, it allows us to scale out the infrastructure, make changes and updates, and do audits very easy. This query is an example of how to look at the CloudWatch policies, which will uh, allow us to figure out, are we actually monitoring services within AWS itself? This is an example of how to get running processes and listening ports using OS query, very simple. Patch management. If we have a server running, how can we keep track of what is actually installed? On the top, this is a specific command used for systems such as Debian and Ubuntu, and it basically says, list everything installed. The problem with the singular command is if you do this, you'll get the default packages, which come from any new service, as well as what you have on top of that. So it's a good idea to do a diff and say, just ignore the default packages. I just want to see the custom packages. Now, these two commands are rather esoteric and um, using old versions of Bash and Unix, which I would not expect nor require a junior developer to know or understand. So you can simplify these complex commands down to the command at the bottom, which is very simple and easy, again, using OS query. So now that we understand what we're trying to solve, the overall approach, and some examples of specific use cases, let's look at how we can start to store and retrieve the information. Going from left to right, we have the extraction. The Elastic Stack uses what they call the Beats framework. This includes the file beat, which allows us to retrieve files from a server, more specifically logs. Packet beat, which allows us to keep track of network connections. Heartbeat, which is a rather high level service similar to the company Pingdom, which basically says, is the website running? Is the database running? Very, very simplistic things. Next, we have metric beat, which allows us to look at things such as how many users are accessing Apache. And then my personal favorite, the audit beat. If somebody has logged into the server on the command line, what, are, what have they done? What are the processes running? So the beats allow us to get all the information we could want to have. <coughs> Next is we have a buffering layer, in this case Kafka, which I'll explain why. Kafka will then send the information to Logstash. Logstash allows us to do very simplistic filtering and modification of the log files. You can do complex transformations, but the performance will not scale very well. It really depends on your specific use cases. So for example, we could add fields of data, remove fields of data, or do simplistic transformations. So Logstash is very useful for that. Next is our load service, in this case, Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is a document store, which is different from SQL. SQL, specifically, is very good at handling numeric data. 
uh, originally designed back in the late 1960s from Oracle was one of the early versions of SQL. Uh, it works great, but it's terrible at doing text analysis. Circa 2004, Elasticsearch was initially created, um, and it allows us to store, retrieve, and search on text documents. So works out very well for doing logging. Next is we have Kibana, which allows us a web front end to visualize our data and create alerts. So this is the overall ELK stack. Now, going back to Kafka, I included this buffering layer because sometimes services such as Elasticsearch and Logstash will become very busy. If they're busy, you will lose logs. Kafka allows a nice buffering layer to smooth over any kind of these load imbalances. So it's a very good service to put there. As far as the alerts go, we use Elasticsearch and a service developed by Yelp known as Elastalert. This allows us to look for specific patterns in the data, and then we send this to the AWS SNS, or Simple Notification Service, which in turn could do things such as sending us an email, sending us a text message, or integrations with various chat applications such as um, Slack, Cisco, etc. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier is doing automated remediation. So this is a bash script, just as an example that it can be done, where we find public facing S3 buckets, which may contain customer data, and we go through and lock them down. So this, this one simple script could have saved companies such as uh, Verizon and more recently Capital One, if it was implemented. Next, let's actually build it. So we've talked about how we want to do more of subset of security compliance how we should approach it, specific examples, and a high level architecture. The question then is, well, how can we actually put these services out there? These services are not available as, my mistake. These services can be purchased from a third party and hosted, but the integrations between them aren't native. So we still need to build a few things. I'm gonna show you how to do that. Uh, for this deployment, I specifically chose to use Packer which allows us to build our AWS AMI virtual machines. I also use it to build Docker images. Packer allows us to create the images, but it doesn't necessarily install and configure services. Traditionally, this was either done manually or with bash scripts. In more modern DevOps um, technologies, we tend to use either Ansible, Chef, or Puppet. I chose Ansible. Once we have the images built, we should have some form of testing and validation. Uh, in this case, I chose server spec. There are many testing frameworks. Server spec is one of the oldest ones out there. It's roughly, I believe, six years old at this point, but uh, has an amazing support community. It allows us to say, yes, we've built the server, but is it actually running? Is it actually configured the way we hoped? So Ansible, in theory, could do this by itself, but in practice, it's always good to have a third-party tool of some kind that can do a double check. However, these three tools combined only allow us to build the servers, EC2 within AWS, but not everything else, such as the S3 file stores, the Aurora database, etc. That's why I chose Terraform. What impresses me so much by Terraform is there's many build services which can be used to deploy AWS resources. The earliest one was the AWS CLI. The AWS CLI is used on a Linux machine running Bash, and it allows us to create resources. So not the worst, but still, it, I'll get to some of the limitations. Now, using Bash to deploy your entire infrastructure is not the best idea. Bash is a very old technology. It's not purpose-built to deploy cloud infrastructure, nor specifically AWS infrastructure. So what AWS created was the AWS SDK. This allows us to use various programming languages that we're familiar with, such as um, PHP, Python, Java, Ruby. Uh, I believe it supports Node.js now. And it allows us to say, we're going to use a programming language, a modern language, more robust than Bash, to programmatically create resources. The problem with this, and I've worked with clients who are large enterprises who have done this in the past, circa creating their infrastructure circa 2010, 2012, etc., <clears throat> is that if you use the AWS CLI or the AWS SDK, there's no state tracking. Now, what that means is if I create a server, let's say a single web server, and I need to go and change and update that, 
those two tools don't keep track of what is the state of the server, how is it configured, what's going on. So if I create the command go and update Apache to a specific version, the code won't necessarily know what to do because it won't understand is Apache already installed an existing installation or is a new installation. Now the code can be written for this but the point of that is that's a really large undertaking and task to actually build a service like that. That's why I'm a huge fan of Terraform because Terraform in combination with services such as Ansible, Chef and Puppet allow us to keep track of the state of the servers. Later on, a few years, we leave uh, 2014, AWS announced CloudFormation. This was their version of trying to take some of the concepts from Chef, Puppet, and Ansible and do infrastructure as code within AWS. Sounded like a great idea. Um, unfortunately, even today, here in 2019 in August, there's a lot of limitations within how CloudFormation can operate. I've pulled up this specific documentation, which I'll send out a link to. Uh, specifically, if you are creating a web stack like the one I mentioned earlier, which includes auto scaling groups, multiple security groups, multiple backend services, you, for at least one CloudFormation template, can only really define 60 parameters, which is a bit ridiculous. <laughs> Those services combined will have over a few hundred parameters. So that's a limitation right there. You can only customize so many things with a single CloudFormation template. Next up is a single CloudFormation template can only deploy 200 resources, which sounds like a large number, but even for my project, which I literally built by myself, my resource count is upwards of, I believe, 150 right now. But the point of that is, that's how much I have created just for a small project. So if you try and create something like an application for enterprise services, you're going to hit that 200 resource limit very, very quickly. Now you can create more than one CloudFormation template. However, it becomes very tedious and difficult to chain them together and to keep them updated and in sync. And again, you're still going to be limited by the 60 parameters and 200 resource limits. I've seen multiple teams and multiple projects who tried to work their way around these limits, but they are inherently built into AWS. And surprisingly, they have not changed at all in the past five years. However, Terraform, allows us to get around this. What Terraform does is it allows us to deploy cloud resources through AWS and many other cloud providers, including Azure and Google Cloud Compute. And it does that by calling their native command lines. So earlier, I mentioned the AWS CLI, which is a bash service to deploy services. Terraform sits on top of that. What's nice about that is these specific limitations of cloud formation are not applied to the AWS CLI. Therefore, Terraform no longer inherits those limitations. Um, so I'm a huge fan of that technology. It's just an amazing product. So I'm gonna dive in to the code. One of the high level goals that I mentioned earlier was that I wanted to keep the service fully automated. <clears throat> so initially when I created this, I was running about four or five commands, and then I spent a bit of time thinking, could I actually automate calling those five commands? And this is the script which I created. So going through top to bottom, simple bash script. You'll notice my local server here is an Ubuntu service. So I'll do sudo cat let's see star dash release <laughs> mistyping today sorry about that so we can see here i'm running ubuntu 1804 lts so this is the test service anyways so first thing it does is it double checks to make sure the necessary resources are installed on the machine this includes the aws cli packer ansible uh, rake which is used to run server spec and finally Terraform. Once we've established that these required packages are enabled, next we're gonna do is check to make sure we have an AWS key pair to work with. When you first create an AWS account, there is no key pair. So this is a very simple check. If it doesn't find a key pair specifically named Packer, which you can rename yourself here obviously, 
it will create one and save it to your local directory. So it's a very simple system. I want to make this something that, again, a junior developer could run and work with. Next up, this project actually inherits 16 other sub projects that I've written, which I'll get to later. So we have the sub module update, just in case anything's been changed. For this specific example, I'll be doing the AWS EC2 simple deploy. There are two versions of this right now. One of them deploys the entire infrastructure with multiple levels of auto scaling, but obviously this costs a bit of my money. For this specific example, I'm just going to show how to deploy this with a uh, single server. So we go ahead and deploy, call the single server, we build our Packer images, and we run Terraform. Pretty straightforward. Within the build Packer script, we keep track of the time and date so we can see how long these things run. And we build three specific AMIs. One is to build the base image, which installs all of the monitoring agents, in this case, the Elastic Beats project. The next image installs Java, in this case, OpenJDK 11. Finally, we install the ELK stack, which includes Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, Kafka, and Zookeeper. So we build the AMIs next. Then we go ahead and call Terraform. Because I wanted to keep this project secure, the first thing we do is we go ahead and grab the public IP address of your specific machine. This is used later on within Terraform to ensure that the firewall rules will only allow your IP address access. This makes the demo inherently secure. And I am a huge fan of uh, secure defaults. So. Next up is we go ahead and we call the AWS CLI and we look for the image that we built earlier for the ELK stack. Now we have Terraform do some general linting and validation and actually go ahead and do the apply. After it does the apply to deploy multiple AWS resources, we go through and grab the IP addresses, print those out. And then we print out the public and private IPs of any other um, of the internal EC2 instances. And finally, we print out the date. So let's go ahead and dig in on what the Packer script is doing, top to bottom. In a production service, I would actually suggest using a service such as um, Gradle, Jenkins, uh, Travis CI, or Bamboo. I would hesitate to put this in production service, but just for illustrative purposes, let's go through. So first thing we do is we grab the default VPC ID, which uh, again, if you have more than one VPC, you could hard code this or put in some other filter. We grab the subnet ID, which is again used by Terraform later on. We grab the AMI ID of the Packer AWS Java instance. Then we go ahead and run Packer validate, inspect it to make sure everything's correct and formatted correctly, and then actually build this. So let's go ahead and, yep, so again, before we did the Beats, then Java, then ELK. So my mistake, this is um, when you go to the ELK section. So after you built the Beats, after you built Java, this is the one to build the ELK specific version. You'll notice is that all three of these chain together. So we it's a sequential order for the builds. Once we have all that going and we call Terraform, here is my mistake. On the ELK server, here is the Ansible scripts. Again, I do not like using Bash in production services, so I went with Ansible as a provider. Uh, here we can see the TCP ports. I've labeled them as far as the services go. Uh, publicly, we only are pushing out the 5601 Kibana port, but the other ports are available for listening if you want to go change the firewall rules later on for easier remote debugging. Next up, we install OpenJDK. We have a cron tab here, which says when the server turns on, make sure to restart the ELK services. There's a bit of a contention issue when you start all of them on the same service. For example, if you start Kibana before Elasticsearch database is running, Kibana will crash. So this uh, script basically turns all the services off and then turns them on in a very specific order and does a few pauses between each of them to make sure they all come up uh, at the right time. Next up, these are various Ansible worlds which I've written in the past and a few open source ones I've reused, which install all of the various agents. So we have OS Query, Kafka, Heartbeat, Metricbeat, Packetbeat, Filebeat, Auditbeat, etc. And then finally the ELK stack, 
at the bottom. What you notice about this is this file is only about 85 characters. And this is the beauty of using a service such as Ansible. It makes it, you'd basically say, pull in the Ansible role, which I'll show you right here. Use these roles. Here's the configuration for each of them. And then just run. That's it. <laughs> I'd much rather use this than a massive, you know, and I've seen this in production, you know, thousand line bash script. Just This is simple, this is clean, and I like it. So that's how we can use Packer to build these. Very simple, very quick. Now let's go ahead and dig in on the Terraform script specifically. Uh, we can see here is we have our variables file. This allows us a singular, much like with Ansible, a singular high-level configuration script. Uh, in this case, we have things such as the um, tagging, which is a very important thing to large infrastructure to keep track of, you know, you have a resource, but who deployed it, for which customer, at what time, et cetera, et cetera. So I put some of those tag information. So you can see my username, you can see my uh, email address. And this is good for internal audits on large infrastructures. You can see I chose US East 1, different availability zones. Um, earlier on the script, I mentioned that we're using my, whoever deploys this script, we use their local IP. So this value gets overwritten later on, which is nice. I went to frankly oversized CIDR block for this, so we can allow quite a few instances if we really want to. Um, broke that down into a dash 24s, so we can have various subnets within our VPC. Um, and next here is we have the AMI. So basically this one is using um, Ubuntu 16 as the base image. So let's do that. I went with a T2X large. So this allows us to customize the service size. If we want to use a larger server or more of them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how that works. First thing we do is deploy our network. This will set up the VPC, the subnets, the internet gateways, um, a lot of things here and there. So that's all nice. And uh, this one in particular, I, I just found somebody else's and I just copy and pasted it because let's keep things simple. Next up, um, I broke this out as, as a individual module for the security groups. When I first designed this, I actually had the security groups embedded into the different service layers. So the web layer had its own security group um, module and the caching layer had its own module, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I actually chose not to do that approach because when I'm doing network diagrams, I find it's actually easier to think of the security groups as kind of like a Venn diagram. So for example, this ALB with the caching layer will talk to the Apache layer. So this is a big Venn diagram right here. So these two will share a security group. The builder in turn will talk to the caching layer and Apache. There's a big circle here and a big circle here. That makes three security groups. <clears throat> so that's why I broke out the security module um, security as its own module. I create all the security groups and then I pass down the name of them later on in the build process. So that keeps things nice and simple. Next up is the key management store. This is used for storing configuration secrets. Um, for this demo, it's fairly simplistic. It basically just stores the RDS database, um, username, password, and address. So it's fairly simplistic. With a larger scale enterprise, for secrets management, this could either be done using, as in this example with the native AWS key management service, it could be done through Ansible Vault or HashiCorp's Vault. Next, we have our AIM, the access roles. You'll notice I'm passing in the key management store parameter ARN here, which again is tied to the users, which are created later on. <coughs> the policy document basically says, allow us to list keys and decrypt them, which I use later on for the services when they need to uh, retrieve the SQL database information. Here is our monitoring and logging layer, which I just happen to call ELK. Uh, again, a lot of the heavy work is being done by the Packer scripts calling Ansible earlier on. So that takes care of that. We can see I put tags, name, owner, owner email. And next we have the parameter store where we actually store the uh, private IP addresses and passwords. So most of these are fairly simplistic, fairly straightforward. I'm gonna dive into the 
auto scaling layer here. My mistake, this is a EC2 instance. And again, we have the VM type, the, my mistake, the base image, in this case Ubuntu, the uh, instance type, so how large is it? And we keep track of the AM profile, which allows us to retrieve the SQL database instances. And I'm gonna go into the user data script here. This is a script that runs when the server turns on. So let's go ahead and look at that really quickly. Simplistic, so we're running as root because this runs at startup using the CloudInit service. Run as root, I uh, go ahead and I download public, the ELK project. And you'll notice if you look at the projects, I do this interesting thing where I have base and config. When Packer runs the first time, it calls the base and literally it just installs things. It doesn't actually configure them. However, the config does, big surprise, configuration. Now the playbook for this one is, is looks identical. You know, requirements are all the same, playbook's the same. What is different though is the vars. And there's a very special segment where it will go ahead and uh, retrieve secrets from AWS using the uh, KMS service. This could also be retrieved using um, HashiCorp's vault service or Ansible vault, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So after that, after the service is running, we configure it on startup, which is using Ansible here. We run the playbook. And next is we go ahead and run server spec to verify that the service is indeed running correctly, that we have the right services installed, uh, right versions, and everything's as it should be. This all gets saved out to the var log service so we can double check and debug as needed. Now, the important thing about this service that I designed is I wanted to enable this as a generic service which could be used for um, PCI, HIPAA, or FedRAMP. What this does is it can retrieve logs from the EC2 servers that we've created using the FileBeat and other services, but it also allows us to pull down the CloudWatch logs. So what's nice about this is, if we want to pull down things such as Elasticache, RDS, or S3 buckets, we can pull down those logs as well. So we get the logs of the servers we deployed, as well as the AWS service logs, and it's all in one place. Uh, this obviously could be replaced with a service such as Splunk or Simologic. Uh, I went with the ELK because it is one of the more robust and mature open source frameworks. So I hope that this presentation has shown you how you can leverage the how you can basically deploy a multi-tiered web app with security logging and monitoring within AWS and how services such as Packer, Terraform, and Vault can be used to help automate deployments as well as make it secure. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it.